in some way, you can't expect, you know, the average Singaporean to do something against their economic self-interest in this area any more than you could expect a, a white American, you know, before the Civil War to uh, voluntarily abolish slavery, right? I mean, I know the comparison is vastly overblown, but the point is you have quite a large group in society in Singapore who benefits whether they like it or not. You know, they might, they, they might not be taking part at all in the... Um, you know, in the bad treatment of migrant workers, but by the existence in a society which benefits from low-cost labor, you are actually benefiting to some extent, right? And so because of that, it's just not really in your self-interest to actually get too worked up about it. Um, so I think that's the basic problem you have to overcome, right? How as a society do you decide to do something because it is right to do, even though it is going to be painful to you and the people you care about, right? That, that's actually the, the challenge here. Because I think we do have an ethical duty to treat other people in Singapore as we would want to be treated. And I think that means trying to figure out what are a set of common standards that, you know, apply to migrant workers as well as the Singaporean workers. And I think if you look at the industry in Singapore, you know, in some areas, I don't think we are that far apart. When it comes to things like uh, safety standards and so on, I mean, um, we, I think we have done a lot of work there, although there are still troubling areas and so on. I mean, that's something which is, I think, on a bit safer ground. When it comes to the living standard problem, I think the problem really is, are the standards fit for purpose? And are the standards the same that would prevail to Singaporean workers if they were in the same conditions? Uh, you know, that doesn't mean that, for example, migrant workers should have the same housing if it should be housing. What it means is that if Singaporeans were also in worker dormitories for an extended period of time, we might have a certain idea about the kind of standards that should apply to Singaporeans. And therefore, the same idea should apply to, you know, foreign workers in those standards as well. Should be the same kind of uh, ish standard. Um, wages, honestly, that's much more tricky because I think if we're honest with ourselves, we'll recognize the whole point of having migrant workers is so that we can pay them less than we would have to pay if we only got Singaporeans. So I think that's something that has to be worked on actually over a longer period of time. But that is also something that you have to think about. Um, will we see substantial change? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's normal to frame this as, oh, I want the government to go and do something about this. Reality is government does what it thinks the public is willing to support, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, occasionally you can rely on a government to do something, uh, you know, that, that the public doesn't exactly support because the government believes it's right or necessary, but a lot of the time, government reflects the popular will. So I think we need some expression of the popular will in this area in order for there to be structural change that the government actually embarks on. But I think there is some hope because we are facing a confluence of events brought about by COVID-19, which may cause us to rethink why we need so many migrant workers uh, in the particular structure that we have here in Singapore, right? Uh, what I mean by that is, I think we're facing a real threat in Singapore to the high population model for growth. Uh, you know, for, for I think two broad sets of reasons. One is that, um, you know, I think we're seeing that having a high population concentrated in the area actually reduces resilience to some extent because of all of these supply chain vulnerabilities, uh, coping with medical, you know, disease outbreaks and so on. So that's something to worry about a bit. I think the other aspect is the benefit from concentration uh, is actually getting eroded very rapidly, right? Because of, for example, remote working. Uh, you have a lot of people concentrated traditionally in a big city because there's a lot of economic benefit from that. But you know, the more you can get away with remote working, the more some of your workers are going to say, why, am I, why do I have to be in Singapore? I could, you know, be in Cincinnati and do the same job. So from the expatriate's point of view, why send people here expensively when they're doing the same job from wherever they are and they just remote into their colleagues in Singapore? So um, population, you know, and therefore the need to have so many foreign workers to service them, that might actually come under some serious questioning. And when you combine it with the fact that uh, demand in some industries might be suppressed for quite some time, there might be this opportunity to restructure a bit. So I think, uh, let's see what happens. But honestly, none of us really know how the next few months is going to play out. Yeah. But I think that, I think overall, you know, in closing, just my, my main point is, um, all of us, I think, have some individual and collective responsibility to do something about it. We can't just say it's a government problem or an evil employer problem. Uh, and there needs to be, I think, that popular will uh, and 
a rejection of this kind of trickle-up economics model we have where we expect all these uh, lowly paid masses to serve us, that has to, I think, go away a bit. Otherwise, we are not going to get substantial change.